I believe that at some point, cancel culture and what the tech companies are doing, it's going to be so censored. It's not. It, it's a la North Korea type thing at some point or another. I'm not saying tomorrow or the next day. Because people say, oh, you said you were going to be censored. I said, well, we're still on by God's grace. But they can pull the plug any time. They pull the plug on Sandy. Yeah. They pull the plug on Sandy very quickly on it. Uh, so at some point, it's going to be very difficult to get gospel preaching, Bible teaching. By God's grace, this church has been preaching the gospel for some time. And we've cataloged these, uh, these teachings. And Davey, and I think David, I think Sheila... And my wife, they, they've done a great job of cataloging all this. There is a website called Bread for the Famine. You can go and you can find all the, uh, I guess, most of the teachings. I said 90% of them are there that we've done here by book. So they're organized by books. And you can, if you want to listen to Mark and when I taught Philippians, when I taught the other ones. And they're there and you can tell, you know, instead of looking them on YouTube, sometimes that could be a long process. They're there. Now we have some playlists on YouTube and that helps too. But if you order Bread for the Famine, you'll find it. We've also know that at some point the internet's going to be very monitored. It already is, unless you get like a VPN. But even a lot of a lot of VPNs get corrupted. Like uh, I think Nord Nord VPN got hacked. They didn't, they didn't tell anybody. But if you use that, uh, sorry, it's it got hacked. The, the, the things like that happen. Even if you use a good VPN, uh, all these things are not false, are not safe proof. So we know that that's going to happen. So we put all of our messages on MP3 files on a USB drive. Uh, long were the days of CDs, right? You can get a stack of CDs when you went to a conference and went home. Now, I don't know when the last time I bought a CD. So a lot of it now, it's on MP3 files and all that stuff. So uh, they're all the, the, the Bible studies that we've done here, I think for the last 15 years or so are there. Maybe a few of them are missing. And you can get it on a USB drive. And um, you can sign up today if you want to get one. I think they're twenty dollars because of the cost of the 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 the, the thing. It's really big, and then we're donating the money to the mission field, uh, send it to missionaries. Twenty dollars USB. We we'll mail it to your house. It's got all the messages that I think we've done. I think I've done all the books except for Hebrews and Second Corinthians. Those are not the ones that are there. So, um, but otherwise, what's that? No, New Testament. New Testament. Yeah. Oh, it's a long time. I I don't know. It's like the guy who preached Joe for 13 years. He'd be a real hearty fellowship if I did that, but uh, I don't know if anyone else will be here. Uh, there was a pastor in Ireland. He taught in Ireland. In 13 years, it took him through the book of Job. Man, that's a church. And if you stayed at that church for those 13 years, you were a solid Christian. I, know, I don't mean it as a joke, but you would, you would be, right? After 13 years in Job, you would know that thing. Yeah. Is that the Leslie's are back on. Okay, so anyway, just to finish off, if you would like one or you'd like to send it to someone, send it to your friend, your loved one, your family, your enemies, whoever you want to send it to, you can sign up, right? And uh, if you don't have the money today, just sign up and just say, I haven't paid, and you know, just go online. Talk to Amber. She's got the sign-up sheet, and, uh, and we'll mail you one. And it's got, and, and look, it may not be for today, but God's word never, never returns void. And uh, it cannot be contained. Paul says they can put me in prison, but the word of God is not chained. So they can put us in prison. They can put me in prison, I suppose. That may be that day it'll come. And, uh, but God's word will have already gone out. And it's gone out to the, to the world. So by God's grace. Uh, we've got a Q&A. Um, now, it's fair game, I guess you could say. Don't ask about, you know, where Cain got his wife or something like that. But <laughs> unless it contains to... You can ask it. You can ask it. Fair enough. Okay, it's fair game. Uh, the Leslie's are here. David is here. Sandy is here. And uh, Sandy, you got a mic. I'm going to give uh, the mic. How do we do this? We want to ask questions, but we have to hear you. You know what? I'll just I'll come up and ask. if you have a question, I'll come up and you can say it. And it could be for Sandy. It could be for David. It could be for the Leslie. So maybe Sandy, you can come up here. And David, you can come up here. And let's face the audience. So you're not. Is this mic on? Oh, I think it is. Yeah. Sounds like it. You can share the mic with David. So. Share the um, mic. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Leslie's are here. You're on the seat of. Uh, what? The hot seat. The hot seat. I'm on the hot seat. You're on the hot seat. Two hot seats. All right. Does anyone have any questions for the Leslie, Sandy, or David? Oh, Rick. Brother Rick, let me walk over here. Got questions for all. You do? Yeah. Let's start, start with one. Okay. okay. Uh, 
Pastor David. Um, so you had mentioned, um, first of all, I wanted to commend you on you and your church leadership reaching out to your community um, during the early stages of the pandemic. That was awesome. Um, just a little side note, um, kind of related to that is we were attending a, a different church than here at the time. And when the first stimulus came out, mm -hmm. we actually got a call from our church, but not asking how we were, <laughs> asking if we would be able to donate the stimulus. And Whoa. we were appalled at it, to say the least. Yeah. So, but anyways, yeah. but great job. I'll go to the question, though. Um, in your discussion with your leadership and pastors, probably in your community, have you, did you consider or are you still considering any type of legal action um, to give the church uh, a little more uh, you know stance to, uh, to continue preaching the gospel and, and not to be restricted so much? You know, praise God, you know, where we're at, uh, we, we don't have uh, that kind of uh, condemnation for what we're doing. Um, we're still pretty open. Matter of fact, you know, there's a, Another church that I've I fellowship with them in, in some Bible studies, some men Bible studies, and uh, while we were with them, uh, we had started this this uh, this outreach that we called it Soul, Har Soul Harvest, and that was probably about 15 years ago, and it's still going today. And we have it in their local park right there, right across from the church that we're at now. So we've never really had the 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 need, I guess, to uh, to consider that kind of action. Uh, we've already been pretty, uh, pretty free to do what we want to do, and we just we just keep continue to pray that the door's still open. That what once we get to a situation, I mean, who knows? But right now we're we're very blessed to be where we're at. Amen. Next, have you guys considered that? All the time. Okay. <laughs> I'm no friend of Newsom, so anyway. I was, uh, I was just going to say something yeah. on that. I was encouraging people out here in California to take up lawsuits because a yes. hundred pastors in North Carolina got together and sued the Amen. governor said, you know, you don't have the right to be doing this. Yeah. And they won. Amen. So yeah. there is a time and a place for that. Amen. Do you want to ask the next one to Sandy or? Okay. Can I ask the Leslie's? Are they no longer on? No, they're there. Okay. All right. Lynn and Sarah. We're here. All right. Hi. I, uh, so you guys had mentioned that you had noticed um, by, say, year 2000 that um, a lot of the evangelical churches were compromised or corrupted. I'm just kind of curious if you relate that back to the 54 Johnson Amendment or Johnson whatever regarding the 501c3, if that was the precursor to so much corruption coming into the church? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that we would. Um, obviously, the church entangling itself with the state was sort of a foundational issue where they probably caved. Um, but what we were watching come in is, I mean, the churches were still basically independent of the state. Um, we, when we started publishing the Heroscope as a blog on the internet, a few years right before that, we published a monograph. It's actually a research monograph. And it's called The Pied Pipers of Purpose. And it's about Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker was the leadership guru uh, literally people called him a guru who had been around. I, um, by the time we were writing about him, he was like in his nineties and, um, he had grown up in a home that was part of the Vienna circle and his parents were in, in that, and he had survived Nazi Germany and, um, uh, he's got a sanitized history. We, we spent, a couple of years actually trying to find out his real history and it's been very covered up, but put it in a nutshell, Peter Drucker came up with a philosophy that a corporation was actually an entity, like an organism, a living organism. And he wrote a book called the concept of the corporation. 
Later in his life, he then went and began to work on changing the state. He believed the state was an organism. And he began working on something called planning, programming, and budgeting systems in which um, he, it was based on Skinnerian, B.F. Skinner, psychology of rewards and penalties and how to work the system with a feedback mechanism. So you were constantly monitoring to see if people were progressing and if they were progressing, you would reward them. If they weren't, you would penalize them. He then took this same plan that he was using during the Vietnam War with Robert McNamara and PPBS, it was called. He then took it and moved it into the church. And he developed a, a theory called the three-legged stool in which you had the state, you had the corporations. The third leg is charities, charities, church. And so he began to work on the church. And so he had to set up a system in the church by which the church would be monitored for compliance to become a system, an organism, and that it would be rewarded for compliance and it would be penalized if it didn't comply. And the church needed to conform, he said, to society. Now, society, in his word, was a capital S. That means state. So he began to work on how to merge the church back with the state. He founded Leadership Network, headed by Bob Buford, and then they trained an entire generation of pastors during the 1980s that included uh, Rick Warren um, and um, Bill Hybels and a number of other very high-profile evangelical leaders whose names you would all identify. And then they set up the Emergent Church Network, which would become their vanguard to change new doctrines to get the church to conform. And they also set up the neo-Calvinist movement, same agenda. They set up the mega church movement, same agenda. They worked it every possible way they could. But Rick Warren's purpose driven was the pinnacle of that. The purpose of that was to conform the church <clears throat> to the state and to set in place a system of monitoring the church, data banking everything, putting it into the computer system globally. And then those of you who comply, you're fine. Those that you don't are penalized. So that is the beast that we're looking at now. That is the global church. Well, while all that was going on in the church, yeah. Anybody who's ever worked in a corporate structure or, or government administration, as I have, knows that that same system, PPBS, zero-based budgeting, whatever you may want to call it, has been used at the corporate level. So if you learned it all at work, then you went to church, and they're talking the same lingo. Total quality management. Total quality, yeah, TQM. It all makes sense to you. Hey, this should work because... I use it at the office or I use it at the factory all the time. Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't we use it at the church? Yeah. So I just that's to thank you. Go ahead, Le Leslie. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> well, I uh, I just want to, I want to do another thing. I'm going to put another book up. Okay. So in 1999, we published this monstrosity called the deliberate dumbing down of America. And this is a book that documents the, uh, uh, the last 120 years of education reform and how they purposely dumbed down education and, and transformed academic education into a Skinnerian operant condition where you reward and penalize students and dumb them down intentionally. And we talk about PPBS and TQM and things like that in that book too. I just wanted to thank you, Sarah, for writing about that, because that really helped a lot of people uh, figure things out. Um, and I was also glad to hear the story about you refusing the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the bribe that you were being given. Um, I, I started a Christian coffee house way before it was the thing to do, back in 1970 in Newburgh, Oregon. And uh, it was called the Iron Gate, and it was great. We had people coming up there witnessing and all that kind of stuff, and we needed more money, so the 
the new head of the Iron Gate decided to uh, accept government funds. And when I found out, I was just disheartened. And I went and talked to him. I said, you know that they're going to have restrictions on you now. We're not going to be able to witness to people in here anymore. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Sarah, this is Marco. Lynn, this is Marco. Can you elaborate on what you said about the neo-Calvinists were set up at that time? That, that's news to me, and I, and I thought I knew a lot of it, a lot of this history, but you just, you just, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> you light that, up a bulb. Uh, that was, that was the, one of the toughest research projects we ever had to write about. The reason why is because um, it was very, very difficult to document it. Uh, Leadership Network was set up by Peter Drucker and Bob Buford, but it operated like a secret society, uh, like Freemasons. It was not unlike pro- uh, promise keepers in the same in the same sense. The men that went through the training were a secret group. It was it was a good old boys club. There were very few, if any, women involved at the very beginning, and o- only later they just used certain women that they put forth on the stage as their they propped up women uh, to do their bidding and uh, use them. And so, um, what happened is uh, we knew that the uh, we had inside sources. And at that time, Ken Silva was still alive, who ran the apprising.org website. And we we were furiously trying to research this, but it was like very difficult. We had original source documents from Leadership Network about how they set up the emergent church. Well, some of those guys crossed over the barrier. Mark Driscoll would have been the key one who went back and forth from emergent to um, uh, neo-Calvinist. And uh, there were some other guys. Well, when Mark Driscoll had a major uh, church crash, <laughs> uh, we wrote about it. We, we wrote about, um, uh, we did a series of four posts about the bus that crashed in his church because he was using a bus analogy. And uh, we exposed the entire leadership network plan for setting up the neo-Calvinist church. So if you Google Harriscope and Mark Driscoll, you will eventually get to those four articles. But um, that was a really, really tough one to document. Here's the thing. Most all of the neo-Calvinist leaders that you see, uh, and these guys are are very, very elite, um, they've all been put through the leadership training, leadership network training, indoctrination. And um, especially if they have a mega church, they were all put through the plan and the program and the system. And uh, we have found very few men who are willing to even divulge what they learned in that secret society. Does that include that uh, pastor from New York? What's his last name? Keller? Yes. Uh, Tim Keller is one of the pinnacles of that. In fact, they actually, one of their offshoot organizations is the pinnacle forum. Uh, They, uh, they leadership network diversified. It set up a bajillion different small corporations, large corporations, foundations, institutes. Uh, They set up Josie Bass publishing. So they became their own interlocking system. So let's say, uh, let's say, for example, Lynn was a young up, hip up and coming hip pastor, they'd nab him, they'd put him through the training. And if he went along with the program, drank their Kool-Aid, they'd put him into a book contract. And let's say he'd write, you know, a fairly credible book, a gospel oriented book, but towards the end of the book, he'd add some little twitch of error. You know, just a little hip thing that his own unique spin on why we really don't need this old orthodox doctrine anymore. We can change it. But he'd be orthodox enough. He'd get the book contract. He'd go on the conference circuit. In fact, they set up all their own conferences all over the country. And they set up all their own media and their own advertising. So he would become hip. He'd become famous. And as soon as social media came along, they'd prop him up on social media. And he'd become famous. He'd become an influencer. Okay. So um, that's how they did it. So guys like Tim Keller, he was on the ground floor. He was one of the early guys. And he came in and totally 
he wrote a whole series of books that were pretty orthodox, but by the end of it, he was writing books about how the church needs to become part of the new world order. I mean, basically his concept of a citywide church is a citywide church fits right into New York City's government, governance system, and becomes part of the entire hub of social services, welfare, charity, foundations, corporations, blah, blah, blah. It's a totally compromised church. Where's the gospel? The interesting part to me is that, you know, they set all this stuff up uh, with the charities and everything, and they absolutely just kind of poo-pooed the people who were doing actual charity work, which was the missions, missionaries. You know, they were the ones who were getting stuff to actual people. These guys had no idea about how to get, you know, supplies or money. They'd hand it off to some guy and he'd take off, you know, with the money. And that just really bothered me. The same thing happened with uh, uh, what's-his-face. But, yep. Well, Peter Peter, um, Wagner was a big part of this, too, you need to remember. You know, and the, when, the whole uh, new apostolic reformation was part of this. Yeah, I, I worked. I worked uh, about seventeen years uh, in the corporate business, and um, and they they had us read that the Peter Drucker book, you know. And uh, <laughs> so as we read that, you know, I'm just like, okay, this is definitely for a business mindset. Uh, and then I started doing research into um, uh, the leadership network and. Uh, heard Bob Buford and, and Rick Warren talking about Drucker and how oh yeah you know this so he 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 changed the game and and all this and I'm like why is that even part of like the evangelical yes. church when it's right. strictly business it's straight oriented to, towards yeah, business they, um, they had um, I don't know if you know this but uh, but uh, Rick Warren got his doctorate. <laughs> From Fuller, under his his mentor was C. Peter Wagner, and most yeah. of his bibliography is C. Peter Wagner books, and it's mm-hmm. probably one of the, uh, somebody sent me his doctoral thesis. I have it at home, and it's one of the worst ones I've ever read. I mean, it's all about how he started his church, you know, and they went out to they went out to the community and they handed out you know. Um, a questionnaire and a, what do you want in your church you know this is to both christians and un, unbelievers and so then they got back and compiled that data and that's how he started saddleback but that's what his thesis is all about and it's it's like you know it's got to be more serious than that you know well, and, the, and the the flip the flip side to that was too when they were doing these uh these you know questioning and, and asking uh, you know these uh surveys um you know when uh, as a, a Christian, when we go out and to evangelize, we want to share the gospel of the true gospel. We want to share the message of the true gospel. Um, and in his questions, he would ask, do you attend a church, a mosque, or whatever religious organization uh, or house of worship? And as, as if they said yes, that was the end of the conversation from him. There was no questioning onto what they were believing. As, oh, well, as long as you're part of an organization, keep going. There was never a gospel presentation of, of what it means to be saved, to be de, you know delivered, and 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 that to, that right off the bat shows you that for them is is about making this well the seeker sensitive movement, you know where you know what do you want to see in your church, yeah, exactly. and so that's what made church so worldly. I got one more comment on CPU Wagner. Unfortunately, his uh, materials came into Calvary Chapel out there in Hawaii uh, during a teachers conference and it was a it was a series of questions and stuff to help you find out what your gift is and so he had all these questions on there and interestingly this is all women teachers one of the questions was how do I become an apostle (laughs) oops yeah I have a question Sarah um today in today's schools they are on Zoom now. And I looked into that also, and they call it the human capital. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. And it's, it's basically these stakeholders and these big corporations who bank, who, who bet on these children 
and they view all the data of how they act on these Zoom and classes and it's so awful to try to explain this to parents, what's going on with their kids, and that they're being redirected in, um, what is it, uh, what they're going to do in the future. Right. Which basically they're going to put all these kids on these blockchains to make them money, which adds mm -hmm. more to the data. And, you know, there's just so many, um, like, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? How do we, how do you explain these to these poor parents who have no idea that their children are being viewed, um, scrutinized, they're, they're being um, bet, bet, like they're Vegas, being betted on, that they, if their future doesn't look good, if they're not paying attention, if they have to take a lot of bathroom breaks, these kids yeah. are going to be, a Trump hat. they're going to, yeah, and, exactly. and yeah. They're, these kids, are, they're in trouble. I mean, I went, you know, and these kids are committing suicide today more than COVID is killing anybody. I'm sorry. These are, are young people who I don't even have the answer. I, I, I don't even know what to do. Where do we start? I prayed about it. I don't know. Marco doesn't know. Well, um. Uh, first of all, if you can get a copy of The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, the book I held up, the thick one, definitely you need to read it because that is history you need to know. The actual first time we heard children referred to as human capital came out of an education reform document um, published in 1990 by the Iowa Department of Education. And it was written by a man named David Hornbeck, who was working for the Carnegie Foundation. And he was going all over the country, state by state, with a word processor. This was pre-computer, you know, pre-laptop days. And uh, he basically had the same uh, education reform plan for each state. He referred to our children as human capital, and he developed an education reform system, which at that time was called outcome-based education. What that means is that your child had to perform to certain standards and pass assessment tests and meet the outcomes. And if the child did not, they would be put through an incessant feedback loop. So the entire thing was built on a system, a computerized system of data banking, monitoring and surveilling your child. Now, the way they did it back in the 1990s was fairly primitive. It was all done through assessment tests, which were very sophisticated psychological devices. They were not academic tests. They actually, actually monitored a child to see where their threshold level was. And what they meant by that is what would it take for you to disobey or break a law? Satan wanted to know that. He can't read your mind. He had to give tests to children to find out what would it take for you to break the law. That was actually included in the test. There were a lot of other simple questions in those tests too. They were extremely psychological. And if the child did not meet the state ordained outcomes, he would be remediated constantly through that loop. Now, the earliest education reform diagrams actually showed a child hooked up to the system by way of a computer. It actually showed what looked like homeschooling, except that's not homeschooling. The child is constantly hooked up to the internet. In fact, um, um, the Unabomber, remember the Unabomber? One of the things he was reacting to is that computers could monitor every single keystroke that you make. And so there are actually education reform plans where we knew that the computer that they gave a child, even, even charter schools, would monitor every keystroke that child made. No privacy. Now, that data on your child was bought and sold by corporations, including a lot of the social media giants, Facebook, fake book, flake book, whatever you want to call it, got involved in this at certain levels too. So that right now, any child who is hooked to the system by way of a computer to a public school, 
They are being totally compromised, totally surveilled, totally monitored, and every keystroke is being assessed for what they need to do to conform. And they they developed a system with human capital. It's like the Chinese, Chai, you know what I mean, uh, social capital model, that the red social capital model, that your child has to become valuable to society. If you are not valuable to society, bad things will happen. And that's a workforce thing. So uh, the best thing you can do is pull your child completely out of the system. And we raised our children completely outside of the system. Uh, no computer hookups to uh, big state or whatever. Okay. Another name for what they're doing is called diaprax. What's that again? What? <laughs> yeah. Diaprax. Yeah, Dean Gulcher. The dial dialectic with praxis. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. And I have um, another question about, am I allowed to say names? Yeah. Oh, okay, so here in California, in Chino Hills, we have Calvary Chapel with Jack Hibbs. And he had a, um, during the political stuff that was going on with Trump, he had this guy that would come on all the time. What was his name? Charlie Kirk. Charlie. Yes, Charlie Kirk. So I looked Charlie up. USA. Yeah, I looked up Charlie Kirk and wanted to know some things about him because he sounds good on the outside, but everybody was saying he was um, Catholic. But but Jack really loved him, and um, so I did some research, and it's true that the Coach Brothers they fund his. What's it called? Turning point. Turning, Turning point. point. Coach Brothers fund his turning point. And I was, like, shocked by that. Like, you don't know who these people are. And why would he, why would the Coach Brothers be involved in Charlie Kirk's turning point? And why did Jack Hibbs get so, why, how does he not know it when he's been a Christian since the hippie movement? He knows better, yet he's become so involved in this, um, to the point where somebody busted him saying that we're never to uh, disobey Romans 13, you know, the government, God put kings in places, and now he's saying something opposite. Is that part of apostasy or is that okay? When you're done, I, just wanted to add to I can that give also. you a quick answer on why these guys who've been supposedly Christians and been good pastors for many years in Calvary Chapel are falling by the wayside. It's because of the people they're hanging out with. Yes. There's a guy by the name of Danny Lehman who has absolutely ruined Calvary Chapel. All these guys, all these people think he's the best thing since sliced cheese, and he is not. He is a danger. He's, he used to be with what? Well, he is with YWAM. He's a director in YWAM. And uh, he's totally just, at every chance, he's... Uh, promoting the new apostolic, etc. So, I was just going to add to what she was saying too. He also, I've seen the thing where he had Che on, yeah. who's a big oh. in the NAR. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. these guys are all compromising together. I just recently I saw that John Piper was with Che on over there at uh, at Mike Bickle's IHOP. And saying the Mike Bickles ministry was one of the best ministries out there. Yeah. I mean, what is wrong with you people? You know, Mike Bickle is one of the Kansas City prophets. He, he's one of the original people who misled the church along with Paul Kane and uh, uh, Jones. Rick Joyner and Bob Jones and all these guys. I would throw out there, too, that uh, I think we need to keep our eye on the prize. Um whether they're conservative uh, media types or they're liberal media types, um, that's not who we should be listening to. We should be listening to the Holy Spirit and determining right. how we're going to respond. Now we can, as citizens, we can exercise our right to vote and all that, but we need to pray about it beforehand. I've, I've been in churches where they don't vote because, um, well, you could be voting for you know, the person God doesn't want in there. I don't know about all that. I think we each have to prayerfully consider how we want to be involved as citizens while we have the right to do that, knowing that 
those rights are eroding very quickly. And we just have to, you know, go back to the word, personal prayer, ask the Holy Spirit to help us make those decisions and, and listen to whatever argument those folks are putting forward and asking God to reveal to us what is behind the argument, whether it's him or somebody else. I just want to mention to um, follow the money trail. A lot of these huge mega church ministers, ministries, they they get funding. There's a whole army of people that fund them, corporations, philanthropic foundations, that sort of thing. And uh, once you get offered the money, you have to play their tune. And um, they, they control the agenda. And like the story I told you, once you take that money, you're then compromised. Uh, they will buy you off. And uh, I think even in the last, uh, the last few months since November, we have seen a huge falling out, especially even um, on conservative and Christian uh, sides with um, people who are willing to be paid off to be silent or to lie or to just shut down and suppress truth. Um, I do want to say one thing, though, related to that. Um, I spent a lot of time this past year while everything was locked down. I, I got to interview a lot of people because I spent the whole year in physical therapy and I discovered that a lot of the doctrines of the new apostolic reformation have gotten very, very far and wide. You know, the, the analogy of biblical leaven is so true that normal people that I would meet it would have some of these latter rain doctrines. And um, it's a mishmash out there. It, it's really a mess. And to that, then they began adding in all of the conspiracy theory, all of the um, wild and crazy stuff. And uh, as soon as there was a clamp down on what you would call regular conservative news sources, people started going crazy, turning to wild and crazy conspiracy guys. And I need to warn everyone, a lot of that was PSYOP. What is PSYOP? Psychological or operation. It's actually done by the powers that be in order to control your mind, to alter your, your brain, to literally change your way of thinking. And some of it was extremely sophisticated. It used some very visual imagery, very verbal imagery, and it was purposely designed to deceive people and keep people off the track of the truth. So um, we are living in a really, really dangerous time now where you hardly know who to believe and what's true. Hi, Sarah, this question is for you and your husband. Um, we've homeschooled our children before. So as parents, now grandparents, knowing what outcome-based education is, which is now called Common Core, where do you see homeschooling going and how much time do we have left? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to define homeschooling because uh, homeschooling, the way we practiced it, we didn't even register with the state. We were, we were conscientious objectors. Yeah. And um, that's pretty unusual. We did it under the radar. We risked going to jail. We risked losing our children. We relied totally on the Lord for three decades of homeschooling seven children plus a few extra. And um, I would say that people as separate as you can be from any surveillance, any monitoring, any data banking, any oversight, any assessment testing, um, the better off you would be. The more independent you are, the more free you are. And uh, people should reclaim freedom wherever there still is any. Part, part of, another part of the big part of that, being separate from the school system or from the state or whatever, is we felt that if we had registered with the state, which we didn't recognize biblically that the state had authority over our family, God had authority over our family, but any degree that we gave up that authority to the state, that could be used against us to, go, to, to try to get us to go further into giving up more to the state. So you had to draw the line at the very beginning 
um, in order to not be drawn further into it. I actually have an elementary education degree, but I wasn't an official certified teacher, so I didn't meet state requirements. And we both have master's degrees. So it wasn't like we were ideal candidates for the state to go after. Lynn, Sarah, this is Marco. Uh, just to follow up on, on Karen's question, where do you see this going? With the homeschool and the schooling and uh, what's your best perspective? <laughs> uh, you know, we haven't really talked about it because we're not homeschoolers now, but um, where I see it going is it's, it's going to get um, more and more difficult to homeschool children because the charter schools and some of those entities have come in, as Sarah said, with, we'll give you a computer, your child can hook up to the internet, we can provide you with all this education, but going right along with that is the surveillance that comes with it. Um, it's it's going to be very challenging to try to homeschool children um, if you accept any of those kinds of uh, resources from from the state or from the charter schools or whatever. Yeah, we we um, when we moved out here to Ohio about 22 years ago, uh, the Lord immediately put us into a Mennonite environment, uh, Amish and Mennonite, which had exemptions here in, in Ohio, um, which they still have amazingly, um, uh, which is a miracle. There is a, a court case called Yoder versus Wisconsin that's the bedrock of all education freedom in this country. But that court case hangs by a thread and there are actually people uh, working around the clock to uh, try to attack that very court case and destroy all public education in this country. So um, that's a matter of continual prayer. I've, I've talked long and hard with my Christian Amish friends to warn them about the dangers of this. And um, yeah, it, we're, we're in a rough time. All I can say is that we lived as I said, we went day by day. We took step by step. We obeyed the Lord. We listened to the Holy Spirit. We did what the Lord instructed us, and we we didn't react in fear. That that's another thing, you know. Um, I found out when I was a right to life leader that the devil he attacks us with fear. If he can just suddenly come in and bah, you know, we all go ah, and and that's when we're gonna cave. And uh, the Lord just rehearsed with me over and over again, sometimes even in dreams, that I was to stand. I was to withstand. I was to stand over and over and over again. And um, I, I, when I was a right to life leader, I got a death threat. Mm -hmm. I had a witch actually try to curse me, a real witch. And a, a bunch of other very evil things happened to me. And, um, and uh, God... God protected me. But one of the things I learned is that when the devil attacks, we do one thing. We go up. We look up immediately. And we say, Lord, help. Jesus. You know? And uh, and uh, we that way we don't cave. We don't, because I've seen so many, we've seen over the years, oh my goodness, we have five decades of seeing Christians cave compromise, mm -hmm. sell out the tiniest little fear or the tiniest little bit of peer pressure or job pressure or, or conform, you know, you've got to conform to this or conform to that. And they they were gone. They would leave the faith or they would totally abandon their beliefs. And yeah. Well, and, and that's why I said earlier, you know, the, the more you cling to the word and to God, He'll work it out. I I was born and raised in Iowa, Sarah, in Illinois, but we met in Iowa. Mm -hmm. We got married there, had our children in Iowa. Many people don't know this, but the state of Iowa is one of the most progressive educational states yeah. in the country. John Dewey, when he was at the University of Minnesota, was implementing and experimenting with children back in the 1920s. My mother, who grew up in northern Iowa, was and it was a victim was a victim of all of that. Um, and so when we end up moving to Ohio, that was God's way of protecting us and taking us from that very progressive, insidious education system in Iowa, moving us to Ohio, bigger state, but 
had a large Amish Mennonite population that had that God had used to open the door for more freedom in education with your children. Awesome. Go ahead, Andy. Um, this question is for Sandy. The um, Nimrod Simarinus. Thank you. That whole relationship sick thing. Is that similar to Jesus and Mary? To how they... So, no, I'm not saying that that's how... Okay, hold it with that look. I meant that Catholicism has that same thought process of Jesus and Mary. Well, yes. I mean, Catholicism has... They incorporated the whole Nimrod, Semiramis thing into Catholicism. In fact, if you look at the... um, I don't know if it's a monstrance, but it's one of the staffs that the Pope has. It has the symbol of Nimrod on it. It's a, it's a sun. And, uh, and Mary is obviously a continuation of female goddess worship, which would be Diana, Aphrodite, uh, Gaia, and, uh, and back to Semiramis. Who's, that was kind of the genesis of that. So, yeah, and so this, I did a, a DVD on Satan's, uh, Satan's Last Masquerade or whatever, I can't remember what it was called, but uh, it's, it's these Marian appearances. That is, that's either a very high demon or the devil himself uh, appearing as an angel of light. And um, that is very much in, com- I mean, it's something that a lot of, especially women, really respond to. You know, you look at those Marian uh, apparitions, and it's mostly women in the crowd and children. But it's, it's a continuation. It's, it's a way to try to get the, all, all these people who are worshiping Gaia, et cetera, into the Catholic Church because, yeah, here's, here's Gaia. It, it's, it's Mary, you know. The problem is, of course, a few problems. One of them is, Mary all, often appears with a baby in her arms. And who's, who's this baby? Is this a new one? It's not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father as an adult human being. He's, he's not <laughs> a little baby. So that makes me think of also Tammuz, who they included Tammuz worship into the Catholic Church. In fact, early on, if you look at the cardinal uniforms, they don't have a cross on their, on their uh, uniform. They have a T. And that was a symbol of Tammuz. And when they crossed themselves, it was Tammuz. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, if you are really interested, go look at my DVD on church history, and you will see what those guys pulled off. They... They brought in all this stuff from Bab- Babylon and, and Egypt and, and Greek mythology. And so that's their way of trying to appeal to the world because the world loves this Gaia idea, you know, and uh, Mother Nature, you know. Yep. Yes. And so they've done that with, with Mary. They've made Mary into that person. Yes. People who don't know, you mentioned Tammuz. Yes. How Tammuz fit into that relationship? Yeah, uh, Tammuz was Tammuz was the. Go ahead, you can if you want. Oh, sorry. I think Sandy. For those who don't know the relationship with Tammuz and Semiramis and Nimrod, can you explain yeah. that as well, please? Yeah, uh, Tammuz was the son of Nimrod and, Tem- and Semiramis, and he was very highly regarded um, in the ancient times. In fact, he's in the Bible. The women of Israel were weeping over Tammuz. You'll remember that scripture. Uh, they weren't very, you know, uh, the authorities weren't very happy about that. Because Tammuz is uh, very, uh, he's mythological, let's put it that way. We don't know for sure if the guy even existed. Because there's all these stories, like Tammuz was raised from the dead and all this kind of stuff in history. But uh, it was Satan's attempt all the way back at Babel. Now, this is why they had to be sent out of there. It was his attempt to duplicate what he knew was coming 
with Jesus being born. So, um, but it's a fascinating story to me, that whole thing, because just to let you in on something that I think is the case, I can't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but remember how it says that uh, Nimrod was a great hunter before the Lord. I believe he was likely a, a Nephilim, and the reason that he mated with his mother who had already obviously had a dalliance with the demon, and then she became his wife, is that he wanted to produce more. And we know that later on, there were more, because when they went into Canaan, they came back and they said the Anakim, but they also said, we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak. So there were still Nephilim in the land at that time. So that's just my theory, is that that's why they were worshiping this guy. They thought he was the, the greatest thing, you know. But God did not approve of that. Any other questions? Just we're winding down. I know we're we had a long. Yes. It's Roman Catholicism. What does the Bible have to do with Rome? <laughs> well, it, it was it was Constantine. Constantine, you know. But I mean, from a logical standpoint, we're talking Catholic, and my own brother's a Catholic, and he believes he truly does. It's why. Yeah. Sure. Roman, right? Yeah, Roman Catholicism. And that's why the Vatican is there in Rome. And um, it's uh, very... Go ahead, David. Go ahead. I mean, one of the things like you're talking about, all these things that are tied in to, uh, to the polytheistic uh, ideology and stuff, even if you look at, like, in the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church, so much stuff was just... Adopted and renamed. Yes. I mean, even if you look at, uh, for example, the the Pope's yeah. headdress, yeah. it represents the priest of Dagon. Right. So there's so many things that yeah. that were just adopted and changed for for the sake of, of uniting the state. And even the word Catholicism is, is universalism. Right. Yeah. So it, it's, it's just Catholic yeah, Catholic Church is it's just a universal church idea. But yeah, they they, they brought Dagon stuff in there. Um, it's it's phenomenal. When you read about, like, you know, the, the, the wafer, it's got, it used to have, it doesn't always have now, but it used to have IHS printed yeah. on it. Yep. And they would say, oh, that's Jesus. That's, that's initials for Jesus. No, it wasn't originally. It was Iris, Horus, and Set. It was from Babylon. Babylon's, the Babylonians had their own community communion that brought you into like a higher order and all that stuff uh it's unreal i mean uh you start to see that they were the masters of syncretism and like you said they would even rename they went down to south america and they would rename the some of the some of the demons that they were worshiping into saints so that they could worship them inside the church it's unreal Amen. Oh. I just have a real quick question. Yes. More Nephilim They're conceived after the flood. Uh, you know, when the guys went into Canaan and they spied out Canaan, they came back and they said, it was scary, man. We were like grasshoppers before them. <laughs> the Nephilim, they say the Nephilim. So, yes, they were around again. That's why I say that somebody had to have spawned them. And it was the Anakin, it was Anak and his family. Um, but they were around for a little while, well, you know. It just says, though, in the after the flood, yeah. Nephilim were gone, then after the flood, they were there. The they came flood. back again, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Any other questions yeah. before we wind down? So, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is for uh, Leslie and... Uh, for Sarah and, uh, and Lynn, uh, you know, uh, about homeschooling and all that, we had a little one, uh, two years old. I mean, he's going to be two years old. I mean, and trying to do our own research, I mean, in the Internet, they're going to point you to the system. How, what's your recommendation to, I mean, how, how we do the homeschooling without going to the system? Um. I'll 
we bought our own curriculum. Um, we bought our own books from the library. Um, I don't know how much you could even trust library books today, but we bought up, I, I spent decades buying up old library books so, for kids to read curriculum books and things like that. Um, there are some very traditional conservative um, homeschool supply places. One would be Rod and Staff. Now this is Mennonite and it's out of Kentucky and, and you get a paper catalog and um, you, you order, you know, the old fashioned way by, <laughs> you, I don't know how online well, they, they yeah, they, they may be online now, but Rod and Staff still has, everything is Bible-based and everything is uh, agriculture, meaning that it assumes that you're living with your children in nature, on a farm, and a quiet, peaceful, loving environment with a lot of neighbors and friends and family and church. So it's very, it's very calm. It's very peaceful. It's very God-centered. And it's also very academic. And um, I had started my children um, back in 1989 out with different curriculum. But by the time the last 10 years, I was almost totally into Rod and Staff just because it it gave me peace in my spirit that this was godly. A lot of the other curriculums were bringing another junk. Uh, some of the curriculum companies uh, are reconstructionist, dominionist. You have to watch out yeah. for their worldview, even though they yeah. claim they have a biblical worldview. Um, so you want to find out what their doctrine is. And uh, but if you just simply use curriculum, uh, remember I said that Sam Blumenfeld had come into our living room. He's the one that told us to get into mm -hmm. publishing. Sam has Sam wrote a book called Alpha Phonics, Alpha, like Alpha and Omega, Alpha Phonics. And you can still buy that book at any bookstore online, including the big one. And uh, Alpha Phonics is a book that teaches children <laughs> or adults how to read using phonics. No pictures, just words, but you can get very, very creative with it. I bought it for my grandkids and already our five-year-old granddaughter has learned to read by going through alpha phonics at home during the pandemic. So um, if your children learn how to rod and staff math, you've got it. You, you, you know, everything else you just fill in. There's, um, I also taught my kids, <laughs> three of my kids, uh, home, I brought them through homeschool. And frankly, I did not have time to be sitting at a table and teaching them from books. So I found there are a couple of computer curriculums that are good. They're not connected to the internet in any way. And uh, if I needed help, which I did with mathematics <laughs> later when they were in high school, I would hire uh, a girl to come in and teach them, uh, you know, algebra or whatever. And so it, it can be done, you know, but uh, you, you do have to be really careful of stuff that's connected to the Internet. All right. Question. Yeah. My question is for Lynn and Sarah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, uh, in terms of homeschooling, when it comes down to them going to college, how does that play out? Well, for us, it, it, it actually worked. Uh, of our seven children, five of them have, have either a, an associate's degree or we've got one that's a lawyer and is working on a PhD right now. Um, so it's... Uh, but hey, I have Lynn, a uh, question about that yeah, because have... the first two kids went off to college. Um, our oldest son, he lived at home. Uh, he, because the college is only five miles away, but our, our, they they went off to college when they were young, and they they mm -hmm. they struggle in that very secular, immoral environment. Our other kids waited until they were adults before they went to college. They grew up, they got jobs, they worked, they did they did mission work even, and then they decided what God wanted them to do. Uh, and they would, uh, we've got three young adults living in our home right now. And uh, two of them are back in college getting degrees. And, um, but that's our ministry to them. Um, so, it, but, it, uh, no. 
Yeah, I would not recommend sending your kids away to college at all this day and age. They're horrible. The college are indoctrination centers. Christian colleges are completely emergent church now. Um, yeah. But uh, they had no problem uh, accepting my my kids into college. It, they yeah. they were actually happy with homeschool because their testing showed that homeschool kids were actually usually above public school kids. So, yeah. Yes, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow, uh, 10.30, worship time. Uh, so come about 10.15. So uh, don't do the California thing. <laughs> and uh, yes, worship is part of service. It's not an option. Uh, it's not the optional extra that you get. So come, come early. We'll have some, Roy, we have some donuts tomorrow? Yeah, come at 10. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, we do have prayer time at 10 o'clock. We gather. Usually David's uh, busy with his uh, service getting ready. Mauro's getting, uh, he gets on the call. But uh, we get on the call back there at the other building and we pray. We pray for about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, you can join us for that. Sandy will be here. David will be here. Uh, we have worship at 1030. And uh, we got some great dynamic uh, stuff tomorrow. David will lead us in uh, a devotional and a word of encouragement. And Sandy will finish us off. And then we have meet and greet afterwards. So plenty of fellowship and plenty of time to do more. So Lynn, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, it's virtual. I wish we'd give you, guys, give you guys a big hug right now. But uh, <laughs> take it from me. Take it from me. Big hug. Uh, this is better than nothing, but we, we, uh, we thank you so much for spending some afternoons with, so this afternoon with us. And the Lord bless you guys. We will see you soon. Uh, Brother David, would you close us in prayer? And then uh, may the Lord bless you guys and go home.